Welcome to the fourth part of the first lecture. This is the motion of the sphere on a fixed radius, say Earth. If we have a vehicle moving directly south on a spherical Earth with constant velocity v naught relative to the Earth, let's try to find the absolute or the total acceleration of the vehicle using spherical coordinates. Here we're going to write x, y, z, all in capital letters, as being fixed to the Earth, where z is, if you will, directly up from the North Pole and y and, and x are along the equator and then we have this vehicle that's driving directly south and we'll define local coordinates e sub lowercase r as, as up or straight into the sky e sub lowercase c as being east and then e sub theta as being south and the reason we pick these is we try to pick them in, in directions that sort of make sense with regard to uh, or origin as sitting at the center of the earth and then also we want to make sure we have a right-handed coordinate system so we can use everything that we've derived up to this point. So we know that the radius of the Earth is about 6,300 kilometers. Its rotation rate, well, it's this in rev revolutions per second, in other words, one re revolution per day, right? And then we can find what the theta dot is, because theta dot represents the velocity of the vehicle, v sub naught, divided by the radius of the Earth, and that ha also happens to be a constant, so that's what we know. So we know that theta double dot, since theta dot's a constant, that's going to be equal to zero. Phi dot, the acceleration, uh, uh, the rotation of the Earth isn't, isn't changing. It's a constant rate, so that's the acceleration here. Angular acceleration is equal to zero. And then the vehicle is staying on the Earth, so it's not uh, moving into the air or into the ground. So r double dot is equal to r dot. Those are both equal to zero. And so then if we substitute all of this into our acceleration, which is in spherical coordinates as given here, we'd end up with this rather long equation that we can simplify out a bit, right? As shown here, v naught squared divided by r sub v. Okay, and with r e phi dot squared sine squared theta minus r e phi dot squared sine theta cosine theta e sub theta plus 2 phi dot v naught cosine theta e sub phi. Okay. So notice that acceleration on the truck itself, as it's moving south, is actually not zero in every direction. You'd expect an acceleration in, in maybe uh, in the radial direction. In other words, as the truck is driving, you know, it's going along a curved earth, so there is a bit of uh, acceleration downwards towards the center of the earth. But then also there is these two other forces due to Coriolis effects that are occurring, and that's due to the rotation of the earth. As the truck knows that they are fairly small, due to phi dot and phi dot times v naught, but as the vehicle, the truck itself, moves faster, these effects become more prominent. That's why when, like, you're shooting um, maybe a, a missile off or something, then these the Coriolis effects can become quite large. We can mix coordinate systems as well. It's convenient to mix and match of unit vectors in particular and, and the coordinate systems that we might normally associate with them uh, just to suit our own desires. For example, we have E sub n along this direction, E sub theta along that direction, E sub r, and E sub t. And we'll have many occasions where we just write everything kind of willy-nilly as we please. Okay, and we'll really talk more about this in the next lecture. Okay. So, but this is an important aspect of things. If you're not used to it, it's something to, to give some thought to. Newtonian mechanics. Newtonian mechanics, you've seen all this before, an object represented by a point with mass equal to the object M. You have a sum of forces on the particle given by vector F. And then you have linear momentum. It's defined by P, which is M times the velocity of the point uh, V. And these are vectors again. And Newton's laws say that if f is equal to zero, the velocity remains constant. So if there are no forces on the particle, the forces remain constant. Sec Newton's second law says that the time derivative of that momentum is equal to the sum of the forces on the particle. And then the third law, when we have multiple particles, which we'll be going over in a few lectures later, if f i g is j is the force on the particle i exerted by particle j, then we have an equal and opposite force on particle I exerted by particle I. So that's all I want to say about Newtonian mechanics. If you don't remember th this stuff, then please give, give some of this a think and um, be ready for it for when we cover this a bit later on.
degrees of freedom of constraints. One particle in 3D is three degrees of freedom. It can move along, say, x, y, or z direction, or r, phi, and z, or r, phi, and theta. If you restrict it to, say, sliding on a wire, it can move along that wire, but not perpendicular to the wire in either of two directions, so that it's re reduced to one degree of freedom. And in general, what you can say then is the degrees of freedom of one particle is equal to the number of coordinates you have in your system minus the number of constraints. So, for, for example, sliding on a wire, we have two constraints in two perpendicular directions that define, define that restrict the, the motion of the particle along the wire. And we leave one unrestricted, the motion of that particle along the wire itself. Impulse and momentum. Newton's second law is equal to the force, uh, the force is equal to the ch rate change in the momentum with respect to time. If you integrate that over time, they end up with this this impulse uh, from T1 to T2 of, of the force applied as it's, it goes over time, and that's equal to the rate change in the in the in the momentum over that same amount of time. that's given here at the right hand side, and as we reduce the amount of time that we're talking about, um, then we end up being able to write that just if we have a, an impulse, a very short force supplied, like a like a hammer blow, the actual it should be equals here. Sorry. Okay. The actual what ends up happening is that we end up with a change in velocity of the particle as given here, just as it was before minus what it was afterwards. So we'll talk more about this later on as well, but the, imp the concepts of impulse and momentum I hope you've seen before. If we talk about angular momentum, then we're talking about position and velocity of the particle about a particular point. When for the moment we'll say O, and it might be the position is R and the velocity is V, those are both vectors. The angular momentum of a particle about point O, that's given by cap H, that's R cross MV. Okay. And notice angular momentum is a vector itself. And the moment of linear min momentum, mv about o, okay, sometimes it's called that. And we say that the time derivative of this angular momentum, okay, about o, notice that we use a subscript here, o, because if we change the point to some other point, we change the definition of the angular momentum, because we change our definition of r. So, if we take the time derivative of this h of O, we take the time derivative of the right-hand side as well, and that's time derivative of R cross MV, in other words, that's V cross MV plus R cross MA. Well, this M is just a scalar, so this ends up just being M times V cross V, that's equal to zero. R cross MA, notice that this turns out to be F by Newton's second law, in other words, R cross F. So the time derivative of the angular momentum is equal to the sum of the applied moments on this particle about the same point. Notice that if we talk about defining this about O, this also has to be about O. We can't use another point and say, all right, we're applying a, a force, F sub t, on this point, about this point, P, say, and if we change the point, then we have to change both the, the definition of the angular momentum and the moment. All right, work and energy. Well, we have a lot of time occasion to talk about this. Kinetic energy is equal to one half m r dot dot r dot. So one half m times the velocity dot product with itself. It is never ever one half m v squared with v as the scalar. You get yourself in mucho trouble using this. As a particle moves by dr, the forces on it do work dw f dot dr. In other words, if we write the acceleration in M MA dot dr, then we can end up saying that that's one half m d v dot v is equal to dt, and that gives us our kinetic energy. And as a consequence, by integrating both of this side, both sides here, we can end up working out the work energy theorem. The kinetic energy we have at say point two time two is equal to the kinetic energy at point or time one plus the work that has been done on the particle from time one to time two. So the kinetic energy we have at some point is the kinetic energy that we had before, plus the work that was done to get it to this new point. Conservative forces. 
Work by these forces does not depend on the path taken. So in other words, it's a perfect differential. All right. So if you take a circular path it, uh, for a particular point and the, where you have only conservative forces applied, then let's say the conservative forces are F here, and as you make a closed path, that integral has to be equal to zero. So there's no work done if it goes back to the same point that it was before. We can represent a conservative force by a potential function v, such that v at r is equal to the minus r to r, lowercase r, r, r sub cap r, such a way that it's the force times this displacement, okay, where we are using a datum. Gravity, for example, is a conservative force. And this V, we could write as a potential, is G lowercase m1, the cap m2, divided by R with a minus sign. Strain energy is another popular uh, conservative force, and we can write V as shown here, where you have the, the stress and the strain. So if you have conservative force in your system, then del cross F is equal to zero. So in other words, in this F, Let's go to minus del, del V R. So we're able to write what the actual force itself is as a vector f in vector form as a, the, the product del of this original potential definition V. Del cross F, if that's equal to zero, then F is conservative. This is a good check for this kind of uh, behavior. You can check if F is conservative or not very quickly this way. If you split infinitesimal work into conservative and non-conservative parts, so we have conservative part here and then the non-conservative part here, we can write the conservative part in terms of V, and then the non-conservative part we can just leave alone, and we can we can work with that as shown here. We have the kinetic energy change is equal to the the potential energy change with this extra non-conservative part left in. If you have the kinetic energy plus potential energy, it's the total system energy. You can write the system total energy as it is it in the new point two is it equal to the system total energy as it was in the previous point, plus the work that has been done on the system by the non-conservative forces. Notice that you know this total system energy incorporates the conservative uh, work uh, potential function in here v. Power, of course, is equal to f dot v. Right? Notice that the power is always a scalar. Equilibrium st stability. Static equilibrium is whenever the sum of the forces is equal to zero, so we don't have any acceleration. And we have, uh, have to worry about what kind of equilibrium it might be. It might be unstable or stable, and it might be at uh, either a, a saddle point at um, on that particular unstable point, or it might be stable. Okay. Marginal or unstable. And marginal is often popular to say in control systems. Okay, if the potential energy is at a minimum, the equilibrium point at the equilibrium point is a stable equilibrium, and it turns out it's not exactly easy to figure this out. There's uh, a book in the syllabus um, that's written by Marovitch, and it turns out that you have to use, to use fairly advanced dynamics to figure all this out. Dynamics equilibrium, on the other hand, we can talk about using the Lambert's principle in virtual work, and we'll use that quite a bit later on. First integrals, you may or may have not heard of this, but in either case, you surely have seen a uh, few first integrals yourself. Energy is the first integral. Momentum is another first integral. It's just when you take, say, acceleration, which is, as a vector, say, it's just the second derivative. And then if we integrate this once, say, with respect to time, we end up getting a velocity, and if we write things in terms of, say, the velocity of a particle or something, that's said to be a first integral, because we've used one integral to get to this point. Energy often uses, say, the velocity of the particles. Momentum is a similar sort of deal, so these are called first integrals. There's others, and very important ones as well, Lagrangian and Hamiltonian, Jacobian integrals. All of these are really quite useful. And um, sometimes it's possible to integrate once to find sort of a solution, but then you can't actually find the position of the particles. So in other words, you can find the first integral solution, but not the complete solution. And so then sometimes what you have to do is you resort to what's called a phase portrait solution, 
where you plot only the first integrals and that tells you something about what's going on in the system even though you can't back out everything. I hope you keep up with the material in the course. You'll find that the solutions to the problem objective at the beginning will provide uh, provided via Barrow Solutions Manual. I'm going to put Barrow Solutions Manual up on MUSO, so if you look on there, you'll be able to see it. And the goal of that is is that you can use Barrow Solution Manual uh, to to help you with the material. And in, and there's many many problems that you can work out in Barrow's book, and I'm providing you uh, solutions in such a way that uh, you can get a lot of practice on working these problems, even for problems that we're not going to cover in this course. And uh, my goal is is that you feel like you're learning something uh, useful in this in this unit. All right, so keep up with the material if you can. Most of this material should be a review, although I, I expect that you probably haven't seen it in the way I've just shown it. You know, I'd like to make sure that you've read Barrow's Chapter 1 and try the problem objectives and see if you can do them. If you can, then you know that you're in good shape for the next lecture. And we'll build upon these basics in the com coming weeks. So if you don't understand what's going on in here, uh, you need to really work hard now so that you don't fall behind when we have to use this stuff uh, in all the time later on. Relative motion, for example, analytical mechanics, rigid body motion, all of these things we'll be using um, what we've shown today. Something just a trick to remember now. If the acceleration of velocity is constant or a function of time, we can directly integrate to obtain velocity and displacement. And if one of these is a function of position x or, or say, v, something like that, you can always use the chain rule. For example, acceleration, well, that's a time derivative of velocity. But really, the time derivative of velocity can be written via the chain rule, dv dx, and that's dx dt. Well, in other words, we can write dv dx times this is the velocity. So dv dx times v. Notice that we don't have any time expression of time in here really at all. Now you can integrate with respect to position. We can integrate both sides with respect to position. And in the third lecture, this would be really handy. For this for vector form, unfortunately, this is more complex, but it's still really handy. Keep this trick in mind. Thank you.